let the record show that I'm calling with a quorum of the council here. We're calling the special meeting of the council to order at 6.33 on April 4th, 2019. The, uh, sorry, I was not used to not having to hold the button down. Uh, pursuant to Charter Section 5.5C, the Town Council has determined that it is prudent to separately consider and act on the regional school portion of the budget due to legal requirements, agreements with uh, regional entities of which Amherst is a participant or other substantial cause. Those are the reasons um, cited in the charter uh, specifically to take a budget um, portion, a portion of the budget separately. Uh, the council will consider whether to approve the proposed regional school budget, the proposed assessment method, and whether to agree to a proposed capital expenditure during the month of uh, capital expenditure during the month of April. So with that, I want to recognize uh, Dr. Morris, our superintendent of schools, and Sean Mangano, the finance director of the uh, regional schools, um, to, to present the budget to the council. And uh, then afterwards, uh, if there are any questions from the council, we'll take them. There are no members of the public present, but we would take public. Oh, there is one. So we will take, if there are questions from the public, we will take questions from the public. So thank you. Dr. Morris. Sure. So uh, thank you all for having us. We did a, Mr. Morgano and I did a lengthier presentation with the Finance Committee, I want to say it was last week uh, or so. So we know there's a, this is really important. And we know that there's another meeting that many counselors want to uh, get to this evening. So we're trying to moderate our, uh, the volume of our um, presentation tonight, but we're certainly here to answer any questions you may have. Um, as an overview, this is uh, a more positive budget experience than we've had in recent years at the region. Uh, the primary reason for that is uh, the health insurance um, savings, which Sean, Mr. Mangana will get into in a little bit. Um, but I want to also note that it took us a tremendous amount of work from the four members of the four communities to come up with a assess assessment methodology that at least we had tentative agreement for at the most recent town, four town meeting and I appreciate the participation. I think it was the first four town meeting was perhaps a couple days after this uh, body was formed and, and elected and uh, installed. So I really appreciate your, the learning curve that many of you had to have um, because if there's anything less um, vague or uh, not vague, but anything less clear than how four towns come to a regional assessment in the state Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I'm not sure what that is that we do. So uh, we really appreciate the, the fast learning that you all did and your ability to participate and advocate for a method that uh, works for all four communities. With that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Mangana. Hello. So I'll go over some of the details. Um, again, it's relatively brief, but um, we're happy to answer, answer any detailed questions that you have on the budget. Um, so the proposed budget for FY20 is $32,167,342. Um, this is a 1.1% increase over the prior year's budget, and it includes net additions of 301150 Typically, our budgets include net reductions uh, in the past several years. So again, this is a good budget year um, for a couple reasons, primarily health insurance, and we've had um, positive experience with out-of-district tuitions for charter choice and vocational schools. Uh, as Dr. Morris mentioned, uh, the assessments are shown below uh, according to an assessment method that we came to an agreement on at the Fort Town meeting. It is a modified assessment method from what's in our regional agreement. So it will require an amendment to our regional agreement to use it and then approval of the assessment under that modified method. Um, without getting too into the weeds, but we can, um, the method essentially bases 30% of the assessment on state determined minimum, minimum contributions. Um, which is essentially um, a composite of wealth, different wealth measures, primarily uh, property values and income. And then the remainder of the assessment is based on our regional agreement, which is 99% enrollment. There's a small little piece that's based on EQB. 
So when you plug in that assessment method, those are the amounts you get. So for Amherst, the assessment is 16,444,279, which is a 2.49% increase, slightly under the finance, finance committee's guidance that we received this year. So some of the budget highlights. So in terms of our budget increases, the largest one is in um, our wages, which is typically the case. And so our uh, employees that belong to collective bargaining agreements are getting either a 1% increase or most of them are getting a 1.5. We have one um, group that's getting a 1%. They were negotiated in different years. Uh, we have a significant reduction in health insurance. Um, that's due to switching from being self-insured to Maya. Um, so we uh, fundamentally changed our plan design. So that had a, um, a ripple effect on a few things. So the first one is um, we had some enrollment pattern changes. We had lower enrollment than we've had in prior years. Um, some of that is because people have decided to opt out of our insurance because it's not as good as it was before. Um, our insurance is still good compared to the region, but it's just not as good as it was before we switched. Um, we also had changes in enrollment patterns because we required a re-enrollment for all of our employees. So even if you stayed with our insurance, you had to basically select whether you wanted an HMO or a PPO, and more people selected HMO, which is a, a less expensive plan. And then the other one is we had this surcharge from the year before that we thought might go on for up to two years to pay back basically the overage in, in the fund. Um, and because of positive experience, that went away after six months. Um, so that we were counting on that and it went away. So, so those things combined to result in a reduction in health insurance. On the increase side, we do have um, higher costs for out-of-district placements for special education, not um, the charter choice and vocational that I was talking about before, but for special education, we have more placements. Um, so that's an increase to our budget. Um, and then on the revenue side, uh, we're building our budget sort of on a more conservative um, perspective. That, uh, there's a proposed change to the charter tuition reimbursement formula. Um, this change would negatively impact most districts, if not all. Um, it essentially changes the calculation of how your reimbursement is um, calculated and results in less without getting again into the nitty-gritty which I can if, if you have specific questions but um, for the region I think it was somewhere around a hundred thousand dollar decrease from if we kept the existing formula in place so we don't know that yet what formula is going to be um, approved if they keep the existing formula we'll be in a better uh, position next year if they go with the proposed formula from the governor then we'll be prepared for that as well and just adding to that, um, there's also a bill in the House right now that the MMA, the Mass Municipal Association, has um, been involved with um, that would actually have the opposite impact. It would, it would improve our local situation considerably, and I've shared that information. This is just like an hour ago, so I don't expect uh, Mr. Bachman to be able to speak to it, but I shared that because it is uh, the, my organization, the Massachusetts Association of School Superintendents, is trying to partner a bit with um, MMA. Um, to try to think of a different way to um, calculate the costs for local districts of charter school expenditures. So um, I think because it's uncertain, we always try to budget conservatively um, because we think that's the fiscally responsible thing to do, but there is some uncertainty right now in that line. Uh, so this chart just shows our level of service changes to our budget, so additions aren't factored in here. It's just looking at what we budgeted for FY19 and if we rolled that programming forward a year, what that would look like. So as I mentioned before, the wages and staffing, that's our biggest increase due to the, the COLAs um, and, and steps that are given out. Um, the next one is the special education that I mentioned. We have more out of district placements. Um, blue is other programs. That includes the choice tuition, charter tuition, and vocational tuition, which is going down um, because of either flat enrollment or declining enrollment. Uh, the green is our pen primarily the pension that uh, we've won the Hampshire County Retirement System, and that has been growing roughly $100,000 per year. Um, and will for the foreseeable future. Um, the really large decrease is the health insurance drop uh, reduction. Um, again, we went down, I think, somewhere between 10 and 20 plans. Um, the surcharge itself was over 10%, um, so that going away was a big, big deal. Um, and then the pink are all the other costs in the budget, basically, besides those specific uh, cost centers that are shown uh, on the left. So I'll speak to just a few of the additions. There was also some reductions and some adjustments, but um, we thought given the trying to be uh, the right amount of time for tonight. Um, so you'll notice that two are related to mathematics. So we had an external report done of our mathematics program in grades six through 12, and six through, because six through eight is a kind of curriculum band, even though it's not in the region. 
there were significant changes recommended both from an uh, instructional curricular perspective, uh, curricular perspective, but also for an instructional perspective. So we're putting some resources into those areas um, to improve the academic performance and particularly the achievement gap or opportunity gap that our students are showing in terms of their assessment results. Um, another one is the restorative practices program. So we've had that at the high school. It's been very um, received very well by students, uh, faculty, and the community. It came from a community group that organized and advocated for a different way to approach um, not just um, what happens when students uh, perhaps make an error, but also to affect the whole school culture uh, around collaboration and how we support our community to heal uh, when uh, either small or larger incidents occur where there's harm. And so that's been really incredibly successful at the high school. And this is bringing it to the middle school level so that we have it in both sites. And you know, if anyone's interested in finding out more, we recently did a window into ARPS episode, thanks to Amherst Media, uh, with uh, one of the practitioners uh, who's based actually right now in both sites, as well as one of the student leaders in it. And it's, it's worth the 28 minute view, in my opinion, for it gives a lot of information. And um, the student and the staff member are fantastic. The last one is something that we knew years ahead and we planned for and budgeted for uh, in our initial work, is that we knew we had an incoming group of sixth grade students. Uh, with significant needs, and that's not just coming from Amherst, but from all four of our member communities. So we knew this, that this year coming in, just based on the current IEP grids that we had, that we'd be adding um, some additional special education support in that area, and you know, fortuitously ended a year where we're able to do that with less negative impact on our budget, but that actually is the bulk of the ads is um, based on identified needs of students coming in. Yeah, and I'll add one thing to the, um, the last one. It, this is one of those types of things that create is a, a weird dynamic when we have two districts, one at the elementary level, K through six, and one seven through 12. So you'll see a similar, when we get to the Amherst budget hearing, you'll see a similar reduction um, for paras leaving because those paras are going to the 712. But because we have district lines, you know, it's savings to their budget and an increase to the regional budget. So it's just another wrinkle that we sort of have to manage um, when these things come up. So that's most of the presentation. Um, this link above will bring you to the full 207 page budget. Um, that budget has information on academic outcomes, enrollment patterns for in-house enrollment, charter choice, um, vocational enrollment, special ed enrollment. Um, it has staffing information if you wanna see what our staffing patterns have looked like um, over the years. It has the line by line budget, so if you wanna see 50 pages of accounts and what's budgeted and the, what's been spent in the past. Um, all that is, can be found there. Um, and I also give the path, so if you want to try to get to it through our website, um, you can follow those breadcrumbs there. Okay. So, um, Dorothy. Um, I'll turn this on. One of the little graph pages that we've got, um, it said that the special ed education costs went down because there were placement costs in private, state, and the collaborative programs dropped due to the lower cost placement on average. And then I read further and found out it was because you had increased your in-house services so that fewer people had to go to other schools. So I'm trying to reconcile this with the increase that you just showed us. Sorry, actually. So, um Two, two items that I want to share, and then Mr. Mangano can fill in. So one is that when we have sixth grade students come to us, some of those sixth grade students sometimes are already in out-of-district placements. So again, as Mr. Mangano said, we inherit IEPs, and some of them aren't from either dis district that any of the three districts that Mr. Mangano and I work for. And I think the other thing is that families sometimes move into our area, um, and they come in with students at different age levels, and we are legally responsible to fulfill the IEPs. And if those IEPs have out-of-district placement needs, then we are responsible for them. Yeah, and I quickly glanced at what you had, and I don't think that's from this year's budget. I think that was from a pri uh, presentation either last year or earlier this year. So our out-of-district enrollments are sort of on the incline. Um, they yeah. were going down in FY17 and FY18. They were actually at some of the lowest levels they've been. And this past year, we've seen the, the outflow of placements. Well, it, it says FY20 key indicators, so maybe it was anticipating FY20? And also, what, what district is it to? Amherst Pelham Regional School District. Yeah, I'd have to look at it closer, so, because that's not part of the budget document, but I'll take a look at it. It may just be that something was mislabeled. Looking around, uh, Shelman. In one of our office hours, we heard from 
a student and a couple of parents that there were more incidents of um, problems with, with among students in high school. And I was wondering if this additional um, funding, is that going to uh, address some of those issues as well? Yeah, so if you look at the um, addition, selected additions in one of the special education, um, in that box, which Mr. Mangano took a number of positions put in, um, the adjustment counselor, um, so adjustment counselors are, in other states, they're called social workers. Um, they have different, different states have different licensure names for that, but essentially it's uh, working with students who may be struggling with um, social emotional needs and that often manifests in conflict. So I think in addition to the restorative practices piece, which has been in place in the high school, we recognize that some students had additional needs that were being unmet and this is an attempt to meet those needs. Looking around to other questions, I have one, but I was saving it. Um, Evan? Uh, so I just had a quite looking through. First of all, I've never read a regional school budget before, <laughs> and I actually really appreciated all of the explanation of everything, um, because had you just said chapter 46, I would have not known what that was. Uh, so thank you for uh, <coughs> those of us who have never had to do this before. Um, but one of the things that struck me, I think, was the uh, you had those comparisons 2010 to um, 2019 or 2020, whatever it was, um, and a really dramatic increase in um, special education uh, expenditures. And I was just sort of curious if that was due to um, increased special education students or if that was just increased cost of instruction. What, I mean, it was a huge jump. Yeah, I'll start. I mean, I know some of the areas that have grown, the, the cost of placements has gotten more expensive. Um, so I don't think our... I think our numbers over the last 10 years have actually gotten better, but the cost of some of those placements have gotten more expensive. Um, and special education transportation has become a really big uh, cost for us as well. Um, I think this year it's overall over $300,000 that we're spending on just the transportation to out of district placements. Um, so there are certainly cost centers within that that are growing quite a bit. I think one of the things that if uh, our student service director, Faye Brady, was here, uh, what Dr. Brady would say is that um, because um, one of her concerns, I'd say, fiscally, is that because our programming is incredibly robust for special needs, it also attracts families with students with special needs. And that's not a bad thing. You know, we, we feel like we do the right thing by students. It does have a fiscal impact, and that is a challenge. We had, uh, I talked with a family last week, and I won't mention the state, obviously, but they were moving from a neighboring state, um, and they, they looked up which state has special education programs that are working well, and they got a lot of information just online and anecdotal pieces that we take care of the students in the way they should be taken care of. And I'm not suggesting we're perfect, but it does contribute to an increasing number of students who transition or move into our district because of the services we provide. We have more than the average number of um, in-district special education programs uh, as compared to most districts our size. Our, even though it's going up a little bit, our, the number of uh, out-of-district placements we have is roughly half the state average um, between our two districts, between Amherst and the region. Um, it's about 0.6% uh, of our students, and whereas the state average K-12 is 1.1. So a lot of people like the fact that their, student, their children's special needs can be met and they stay within the community and don't have to travel to an out-of-district placement. So that has a fiscal impact on us, um, and yet we're still going to do the right thing by students because um, that's what that's our business um, but it does create some challenges um, for us um, so dr. Brady I know I'm on camera but she would say that she'd, she'd like our special needs programming to be the best kept secret in Amherst and I think she's <laughs> lost that battle um, we recently had an outside audit on special needs and we were we got you know there was, they assess you on like 25 different categories and um, as compared to seven years ago we had no uh, areas of corrected action or basically things you need to do our programs were in uh, condition where the audit showed that we are doing what we should be doing for our students, and that creates some challenges. So, sorry, it's a long-winded answer, but it's, I think it's a complex question. Yes, uh, Mandy. So, I, the assessment method. I know this hearing's on the budget itself, but um, you know, in my time in town meeting and here, I know we've sometimes made out with assessment methods, and other times suffered from them depending on as they change. So I'm curious, um, going forward, I think you said this one might last a year or two. Um, what 
you know, what are your thoughts about the method that is in use as compared to, say, the state mandated one or the regional agreement one? Um, and is there anything we as a town should be thinking about as we look towards assessment methods? Yeah, so um, particularly compared to the state method, um, this method is better for the town of Amherst by several hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, and so that really was a compromise because there's some towns that have interest in going all that to the statutory method and some that want to stay with the regional agreement method and this is, was an attempt to sort of bridge that gap to some extent. Um, so this method is better than the, the alternative of going all the way to the statutory method. Um, in terms of what to think about going forward, um, it, it's sort of, it's difficult. So you, you look at your percentage of enrollment. So if you use an enrollment based method, you look at what percentage is Amherst. So Amherst is roughly 80%. Um, and then if we use a method that's based on property value, you try to look at, all right, well, what proportion of the aggregate property value is in all four towns is Amherst, which somewhere between like 78 and 82%. And that changes over time, that distribution. But how those percentages relate to each other sort of depend, will, will determine whether an enrollment-based method is better for Amherst in particular. And this is, applies to all the towns. Um, but whether an enrollment-based method is better or a property value-based method is, based, uh, is better for Amherst. And you can do the same thing with income. So those sort of relationships is really what um, you know, we look at in terms of, at this present time, what is better for a given town. Um, and then in addition to that, the minimum contributions from the state is sort of an aggregate of those things. So what percentage that is, too, for the four of the four towns. Um, so it's, it's difficult to say. And over the last 15 years, Amherst has at times benefited from the enrollment method and sometimes has paid more because of the enrollment method. Um, and right now, this particular method is a little bit better than um, the state's method. Good. Do we see this sort of debate about the agreement method that's in the regional agreement, the statutory method or something in the middle continuing on for the foreseeable future, or have we potentially reached a, a, a four towns wide compromise that might stick there for the long term? Yeah, so I think it'll depend on the budget situations in each town um, individually, sort of separate from the schools and also the school's budget situation as well. Um, I think we're going to hopefully try it out for two years, and if those two years produce relatively um, predictable assessments that are not uh, huge increases for all four towns, then I think it's possible this could be a method we stick with for a longer term. Um, if a town has a really bad budget year and they get a big increase from this assessment method, it's possible they say, well, we need to find another method. Um, so I, I think it's hard to predict two years down the road. But right now, I'm optimistic that if we try it out for two years, it works as we hope, as we anticipate it will work, um, that it could be something we try, we stick with for a while. And I just, just to add to Sean's point, um, the district has a high interest in having stability in the method. So um, there's a tremendous amount of resources that go into this yearly, it's been five years since we, we changed methods every year. Um, and, and part of that's because the towns are trying to figure out how to support the region and, and their fiscal needs and what fairness means to all the towns doesn't, isn't the same. And, and, and by, I want to be really clear, I'm not referring to Amherst and the small towns. I mean, within the small towns, not just that Amherst is so much larger. And, and there is that, but there's other factors. And so we try to play a facilitatory, facilitating role in helping towns have that discussion. This year we had a little different model where instead of a large working group, we had a smaller uh, working group. And Mr. Steinberg was the representative. And thank you for your time on that. Um, and that seemed to work pretty well this year. Um, so perhaps not having a working group of, that fills a room. Uh, I think we maybe we learned some lessons uh, over the past few years. Uh, but it would be certainly our hope that we would get to a place where there's predictability um, because the, one of the challenges we've faced every year that I've been doing this is just the, there's unpredictability in state budgets, but then there's unpredictability in can we all agree on an assessment method and what does that look like? And um, that's particularly challenging for the district. Okay, Kathy. Um, I'm shifting to a completely different topic. Um, you're mentioning the MMA bill that uh, would help rather than hurt on charter. Um, to what extent do we, as a town, and I would say not just you at the school committee level, get the news out to residents so that we get 
people to give support to our representatives and or write, be writing letters to the governor. So at the local level, but this must cut across all municipalities that have any significant charter presence. So do it in a more organized way so it isn't a few parts of the state. So, so does, that hap does that happen in any coordinated way? So our school committee uh, at the region has taken a more, trying to be, have a more organized stance. They actually have two members who are, it's not an appointed subcommittee, but I think it certainly functions that way uh, around advocacy uh, for the school district. And they've tried to do, uh, they're the ones who often meet with our represent, local representative and senator on issues related to bills that are in the state house and for consideration. Um, that's more recent. That was, I think, this fall that, that that system got set up, and and certainly, again, this was all like literally. Paul probably got the email like 4:45 or something this afternoon. It was pretty recent that all this uh, clarity came on what bill was out there and the MMA and the MASS's role. Um, but it certainly is something not that the town council's up and running that I know that they'd be interested in partnering if there was if there were members who wanted to partner around issues like and, this. And what I was thinking is trying to take it out of the school committee too that our local chamber of commerce should care about this yeah. because it puts pressure on the whole budget and things that would and our local tax base. So just trying to oh, yeah. draw those connections to people that this isn't just one teacher more or less or a student. It's actually depleting resources that we would other bit wise be able to use to uh, name it, you know, on Absolutely. where it might go. Yeah, yeah. I, and I don't want to speak for those members. In this one, I feel pretty confident that I could say that if, if there were, and I'm not asking for much, like, it's not my role, but if there was, if there were town councilors who, who would want to think about with them, um, they would certainly be highly, highly welcome partnership between the school committee and the town council for exactly the reasons you cite. Hmm. When? Where do, where do we stand on the revisions that need to be made to the regional agreement? Um, so I can start that. So I think we're aware of them. We, they weren't quite ready. You know, town, the other towns, town meeting warrant articles were due before it really was able to be finalized for this year, uh, this fall, uh, this spring. Uh, it's something that the town manager and I have spoken about. It comes up almost every time we meet, I think. Um, so I think the thing that we want to make sure of is that we're connecting with the school's attorneys with the town's attorneys to make sure that the language in, the, in our revised regional agreement is not just consistent with what we understand it to be, but that the town of Amherst attorney would look at that and make sure that everybody agrees that that's the language that meets the charter needs and meets the region's needs. Um, so I think the next year is some, that's something we have to take care of. Yes, good. Follow-up question. And so I assume that the school committee would look at that, approve it, and then bring it to the council. That, that is my understanding. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think that is what the uh, requirements are for, the, uh, for any amendment to the regional agreement. It starts with the school committee and then goes to town meetings. And um, part of the problem is, is that it's not clear in the way it's just sort of assumed that it goes to the council because we don't have a town meeting anymore and that's what we need to get clarified. Yep. I would <coughs> thank you for saying that more precisely than I did. That's exactly right. Anything else? Any Oh, yes, Stars, thank you. I just have a, a couple questions about solar. Um, I brought up on Monday a question about whether the three million for the middle school roof includes anything about studying solar readiness of that roof. So that's one question. And the other one is, um, I actually had a conversation yesterday with a couple of juniors at the high school. And, uh, and they, they were happy because they had heard something about that they were going to get budgeting for solar canopies for the high school parking lot. I don't know if this is in this budget. Is the parking lot part of the regional school district? Is the land there? Yes. Anyway, yeah, two questions lot, yeah. about those two things. Yep. <laughs> um, so the first question, we are going to study that, what the cost would be to um, strengthen the middle school roof to be solar ready so that when the state has new um, solar incentive programs, we can um, hop on it. 
Um, so the school committee has been clear, like they want us to explore that and have that ready. So that will be part of our next piece. And that's actually on the regional school committee agenda, not that you want another meeting to go to or you need to, but it is just for public, it will be on the regional school committee agenda for Tuesday just to talk about that and actually this, I think there'll be a motion just that uh, clarifies that point. Yeah, and we're having um, a solar company in the area come out and actually do like a mock system design of what it could potentially look like on our roof, which we'll need to give to the architect so they can um, basically calculate what type of enhancements we would need to make to the roof structure. Um, so that's first question. Um, the roof can or the parking lot canopy. So I believe we submitted um, an application for some funding to study the, um, the feasibility of a, a canopy on the parking lot. So there's no funding in this year's in this budget for it, um, but we're looking into trying to get some funding to study it. Um, so our parking lot's in rough shape, um, and so essentially that's where it's at. Is we're not sure if we're going to get that funding yet. Is that the state budget? So I, I think I can address that. So one of the things uh, the uh, state representative was looking for would be good projects that uh, would fund, that would be support the town. We suggested this because this is already initiated by the students at the Amherst Regional School District. Um, they had already worked with um, people at UMass and had explored this as an option. Uh, suggested to Representative Dome that this might be a great thing for her to get funding for um, for the town of Amherst. So it's not in a it's not in a line item. It's a request by Representative Dome in the budget for this year. Whether it gets funded or not is another question. Um, but when they look at that, they would try to the, they would we wouldn't um, just put up a solar canopy over the existing parking lot. We'd have to incorporate the cost of repaving that parking lot, uh, obviously. Uh, and that would be incorporated into the project. But it's, again, every representative has a list of projects that have been submitted to the Ways and Means Committee. Good. So if that were going to go into a town budget, what budget would that appear in? It would, I believe it would go through the regional school district um, as a capital item. If, if we find out that we get funding um, and it's something that proceeds forward, it would come through the region, because the parking lot is, I believe, 100% region land, so. Dorothy. Yeah. Dorothy. Um, let's say that we get the money for the um, new school, and we get it soon, and we start building a new school, and maybe on the site of the Wildwood School, I'm getting confused with a new roof and solar panels on a building which may not be a school. Uh, but I'm sure you've thought of this. Right. Yeah, this is for the middle school. Middle school. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else? Looking around one last time for the. So, uh, yes. Sorry. Um, capital in general, since I'm new to all of this, where does it appear in this 207 page yes. document? And, and is it part of the 30 some million budget or is it? a separate line item somewhere that we have to pass separately, or how does that work? So it's not part of the $30 million budget. Um, there's a separate section on capital um, that the school committee votes to separate vote each year, uh, authorizing basically borrowing for the projects that are being proposed. Um, those projects are talked about at the four town meetings leading up to the when school committee would vote it so that we have a sense for the towns whether it's a project that is supported. Um, and then we project out what the debt assessment would be. Um, so the debt assessment is a separate assessment from the region. You'll have, a, you have an operating assessment and you have a debt assessment um, from the region. So let me add to that. Uh, both state law and the regional agreement require process for regional districts that have uh, the regional districts present their requests to the towns now, most towns that are participants in regional school districts are towns in the traditional format that we were until um, December 2nd. And uh, the um, select board in those communities can make a decision to take the matter to town meeting, and town meeting can approve or disapprove. If no action is taken, I believe within 60 days of presentation, then it is automatically presented. Um, it is extremely rare in the state, and it is, I cannot recall a time in our district in all of my years in working on this, 
that um, there's ever been a select board in any of the towns that has taken it to town meeting. Um, one of the peculiarities that we're running into now is because uh, of our change in government, we need to make sure that that just gets placed back to the council because we kind of, we don't have a select board to refer to town meeting and a town meeting to act. We're kind of all of it at once. And uh, I think that's one of the things that needs to be corrected in the regional agreement so that we can um, move forward. But in any event, um, it will come forward. And I was going to conclude my remarks tonight with just a summary of the things that we will be needing to consider in the capital request is one. And one other quick thing, um, we have submitted to the MSBA for the middle school roof as well. We'll find out hopefully this summer. It's a different program than the, the new school program. Um, so that could, that three million is for the total cost. We're hoping that'll be lower if we get into the MSBA. Anything else? Because I guess my one question that I'm gonna um, uh, see if there's any questions from the public and uh, the, <laughs> Public has just indicated that there aren't any requests. Um, but uh, there have been, so, you mentioned several things that could vary the amount of money that is coming into the district or is charged to the district um, in um, offsets, including like the charter. And of course, those changes won't be known with certainty until after this. Um, council votes and the other three towns vote on their budgets. Is your anticipation that the money, that if there's extra funds uh, coming in that they would go into excess and deficient uh, E&D or um, what is your thought on how that would be handled? Uh, typically they do. Um, we don't typically have that much um, that a large amount of excess revenue. Sometimes we have expenses if we have a good budget year, but on the revenue side, we don't typically get that much more than what we're budgeting because the variables are usually work against us, not with us. Um, chapter 70, the increases are very small. Um, transportation reimbursement, we usually have a good sense. Sometimes they'll increase the reimbursement rate after we finalize the budget. Um, the one that actually varies the most, but it has an offset, is the charter tuition reimbursement. So if we have a, um, a large number of students go out for charter schools, then we'll have higher tuition on the expense side, but we'll have a higher reimbursement. So they sort of offset each other. Um, and likewise, if we have fewer students go out, our expense side of the budget will look good, but we'll get less reimbursement than we were planning on also. So that'll look like it's short on the revenue side. So that's usually the one that um, will vary the most and it typically is offset with something on the expense side. Thank you. Um, just so everybody knows, uh, regional district being a separate entity has essentially something that's a dish, uh, equivalent to what we term as free cash in municipal budgets, and it is the E and D accounts. Yeah, yeah, and just I mean, so um, that regional school districts can set aside in their E and D account five percent of their operating budget and their capital budget, and they can't go over that five percent. Um, if they go above the 5%, it's returned to the towns, which we've done in the past. That's happened in the past in other regions. Um, so th that's how the mechanism works if we go above that 5%. Yeah. I just, um, it's probably in the long document, but I'll ask you, it's easier. How many total charter students do you have now in the regional school system? Yeah. A, the, that are in the charter. That are in charter. It's about... 95 to 100, somewhere in that range. I don't think so I that's a little bit less than what I saw a couple years ago, or about the same? It's about the same. So, for the first time last year, our charter enrollment, enrollment didn't grow. Um, it had grown for many years as the, the local charter school in the area kept adding grades. Um, and so, they've kind of maxed out with their grades. And for the first time, we actually saw some students come back to us. I think we went maybe down a student or two or, or stayed flat. Um, so, that's why our budget's been very unpredictable the last five years, because it's always trying to guess how many students are going to go to charter school as they add grades. Now that that's sort of at a more stable level, I think we'll see that the number of students stabilize as well. Okay. Yes, Shalom. I'm, I'm trying to understand the, this, in the capital plan, there is the 10-year projection. So we have the $3 million mm -hmm. for the middle school roof, and then... FY22, there's 5 million, and then 
we, when we were doing the interactive tool, we had two and a half million dollars right. yeah. for ongoing capital right. needs. So how do, how do we reconcile that? So the um, regional school committee, uh, the regional school debt that is approved comes into the JCPC process as debt. It doesn't come in as projects, it comes in as, um, as debt. And so the way JCPC works is they start with what's available for capital, and then they subtract out whatever debt is existing. So that could be the regional school debt, it could be debt relating to um, JCPC projects that have been approved in the past, but that sort of comes off first because they're, it's required. Um, so to your point, in the 2.5 million, that would have to factor in regional school debt as well. And, and all other debt that's on the books. We're already hitting the debt limit. Well, that's, that's the total cost of the project. That wouldn't be the debt assessment. The debt assessment would be um, just because Amherst would pay its portion, and it would be probably split up over, depending on the project, between 10 and 20 years. Yeah, anything else? Looking around one last time. All right, well, thank you very much. I appreciate you being here. Just for uh, what, what is going to happen now is that um, uh, Tuesday of next week, the Finance Committee will take a vote on the issues that will be before us, and I'll just remind everybody what they are. And then either on April 22nd or 29th, um, the Council at the President's discretion um, will consider any recommendations from the Finance Committee. The things that are before us would, are there's a requirement that um, the budget be approved by three uh, out of the four towns. There's a requirement that the assessment method, since it is other than the state um, statutory method, has to be approved by all four member towns, so that's the second vote. Um, the third thing we'll have to address is um, the capital project issue, which we discussed, and the fourth is um, that we need to make a motion to, um, if all of uh, the first two that I list passed, to raise and appropriate the 16 million, I think it's $444,279 um, for the um, regional school, to meet the regional school assessment. So those are the four things that um, will ultimately be required um, actions of the uh, council. Uh, Just to clarify, will the finance committee be making recommendations on all four of those? Yes. Thank you. So, um, seeing no other purpose, uh, I think that I want to thank you, Dr. Morris and Mr. Mangano, for being with us this evening and presenting and um, responding to all of the questions that came. And um, I uh, want to therefore adjourn the public hearing. And. Um, I want to adjourn the council. I, is there a motion to adjourn the special meeting of the town council? So moved. Second. Second. The motion is made and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. The vote for that is unanimous with mm, 10 of us being here. Thank you.